If you've been watching this channel a while, you know I mostly stick to covering vintage computer gear, often machines of the early era from the mid-1970s and onward. But just about anything that is electronic and vintage interests me, so here we are. My wife and I were working on a room for our daughter who was returning home from university to work for a few months. We rented one of those huge Home Depot vans to aid in moving drywall around and other junk out, and as it happened on one particular trip up to our local dump, I noticed something unusual peeking out of the top of the e-waste bin. It caught my eye because I had been there yesterday dropping off computers. No, not vintage computers, just modern junk nobody wants. And it was not there that day. I don't normally do much investigation of our local e-waste bin. Number one, generally as a rule, they don't like it if you take stuff from there, even though it does fit the reuse category of the three R's. And the second reason? Well, there's rarely anything interesting in there. Although you might have found something worth fishing out a decade or so ago, like an old CRT television or a gaming console, these days it's almost exclusively modern junk like broken flat panel TVs. Anyway, at first I thought the object of my intention might be one of those blackjack consoles you often see sitting on bars, or some kind of mini vending machine. Curiosity got the cat and I rolled over there to take a look. To my astonishment, it wasn't a blackjack machine, or a vending machine. It was an arcade machine. I couldn't believe it. We don't get cool stuff like that being tossed these days. I've often read of other people trash picking awesome stuff, but they're usually in the states, in major metropolitan centers, where stuff like this was sold in enough volume to pop up once in a while. Up here, this stuff is much rarer, and a lot of people these days are pretty aware of its value. Now, I wasn't, like, intending to take this dumpstered arcade machine. After all, I figured there had to be a reason why someone had chucked it in there. It had mud and all kinds of garbage all over it, and I felt pretty certain whoever dumped it in there probably took no care whatsoever not to damage it further, placing it in the bin. However, since the machine was missing its back panel, I could see right inside, and yeah, amazingly everything looked okay. Even the incredibly exposed CRT neck looked like it was just perfect. Anyway, right about now my wife mentions that my youngest daughter was thinking of redoing her room in an arcade theme, and it'd be kind of neat to have a little arcade machine, and I didn't hear the rest of her sentence because I was already talking to the e-waste guy about whether or not it'd be okay to take it, and then dove into the dumpster and was busy wrestling the thing out. I think my wife was referring to one of those new kit machines you can build like 1UP rather than trying to haul 100 pounds of someone else's garbage home. But I think she probably saw the futility in trying to stop me at this point, so she decided to let me save it. It was a big job getting it out of the bin. It felt like it weighed 100 pounds. But we shoved it into the van and we were out of there, me grinning like I just boosted the British crown jewels. Now to be clear, while I'm a longtime fan of arcades and have many fond memories of wasting my dad's money playing Pac-Man or what have you, I've drawn the line at actually collecting them. Arcades are wonderful, but they're a whole other level of collecting insanity compared to computers. With vintage computer collecting, at least much of what you collect was originally designed to fit comfortably into a home. But arcades were designed for commercial environments with tons of space. You can fit a lot of vintage computers into the space occupied by a single arcade machine. Plus, if it's a vintage original, that arcade can only play one game. Since I'm an originalist, I couldn't bring myself to modify a classic machine to play more games, so yeah, I'd be in a real bind. And besides, look what these things go for. No thanks. I'm in deep enough already with one expensive, insane, space-consuming hobby. I don't need two. But free? That's a different matter. I couldn't just let this get destroyed, even though it looks like it was buried beside Doc Brown's time machine in Back to the Future 3 for about 70 years. It's still a real, authentic machine. If I couldn't revive it, surely someone else could, or would. Maybe the parts would be of value to somebody. I mean, what are the odds something like this would just show up in an e-waste bin on the only day I had a van big enough to move it? That's Providence, I tell you. So yeah, we rolled it home, and yeah, here it is. The first thing to note is it's kind of odd looking. It's not a full height cabinet, rather it appears to be designed for sitting down use. Another thing, there's no game arcade to tell you what game it is. There's just this very generic video game arcade up top, along with the name of the company that presumably provided it. While I was moving the machine, this fridge magnet thing fell off. This is exactly the sort of establishment a machine like this might have served, although given the modern internet references, this may or may not actually be where it was situated. Inside the back here we can see the PCBs and right on top of that metal plate appears to be the word scramble. I don't remember scramble personally, but looking at it in emulation it looks pretty cool. Lots of colors, lots of action. To try and get some more information about this cabinet, I decided to join a Facebook group called Arcade Restoration. It looks like this cabinet was made by Taycon? Tecon? Uh, Corpolation? Spelling error, I think. Yeah, Tecon is a Japanese manufacturer of arcade cabinets, and yes, they were designed to be sit-down rather than stand-up. 
You can see on the side here there's these knobs which do allow for some height adjustment, but apparently it's only a few inches. Takang cabinets are fairly common in Japan apparently, but not so much here. Given that I live in British Columbia, it's probably not too surprising to see an imported Japanese cabinet like this here. Probably this Coastal Games Limited company imported this stuff directly from Japan and then outfitted it for themselves and sold it on. I tried to confirm the boards installed were in fact scrambled by looking up the arcade PCBs on eBay. The boards look pretty identical to mine overall, but I noticed my board is missing the logo of Konami, the game's publisher. I asked about this online, and it turns out these boards may actually be bootleg copies of the originals. I must confess, I had no idea piracy was a thing in arcade games. I assumed commercial arcades were way too public facing to get away with that, but it turns out piracy was a thing right from the beginning. When Atari's Pong became a hit, competitors, typically based in Asia, immediately began offering pretty much direct copies of their design. Atari and other manufacturers, of course, did try to defend their designs. But in the early days of electronic software, the legal system didn't really understand what they were dealing with. The copywriting of software was a novelty to many courts, and sometimes cases got thrown out in the mistaken belief that copyright did not exist for something that didn't exist in a printed format. And even when cases were successful, by the time they were completed, the infringers had often packed up shop and moved on. This led to companies taking other measures, such as placing copyright messages and such on screen. In one particularly aggressive move, Nintendo of America actually got federal marshals to seize illicit copies of games like Donkey Kong. I can't really find anything about Coastal Games Online, and I have a feeling they were one of those quasi-legit outfits that either got shut down or slipped quietly out of business while ducking legal bullets from arcade makers like Atari along the way. Personally, while I find clones to be unethical in many ways, I do find it interesting to learn about the copycats themselves, what tricks they used, how close they dared to get to the original, law enforcement's efforts to shut them down, and ultimately what happened to them in the end. I do feel pretty confident this machine was probably never in an actual arcade. These generic sorts of machines were more common in restaurant waiting areas and hotel lobbies back in the day, places where the proprietor hoped to entertain their guests while waiting for a table or while staying at their establishment, hoping to earn a few side hustle bucks. I remember nondescript machines like this often sitting next to food and cigarette vending machines. Remember when they used to sell cigarettes out in the open? Anyway, I now have this runt arcade of questionable legality in my garage, and I'm indeed hoping to restore it and ultimately donate it to my daughter's future arcade room. You know, if it doesn't burn down my house first. I think my goal for this video will be just to clean it up a little and assess where it's at, maybe try firing it up if things otherwise look good. Even though this isn't a full-size cabinet with a game I know like Pac-Man, it's still amazing to me that I have this commercial arcade machine in my garage. I wonder how many hours were whiled away by players who, like my childhood self in the early 80s, were just trying to get their names on the high score list, no matter how many of dad's quarters it took. Condition wise, yeah, this thing has some serious wear. You can see the paint has come right off the legs, probably from shoes rubbing up against it. The cabinet wood isn't in bad shape, but the faux wood paneling on top of it definitely is in need of some help. It looks like the lock for the control access panel has been ground away on two sides, not sure why. There's also an access panel over here with the lock still intact. I think that's just for getting access to the PCBs. And then there's the cash box. There's no lock at all on this one. Down below here is the counter that shows how many quarters were put in before this machine was either retired or stopped working. That's about $6,000, which would be north of $10,000 in today's money. I don't know what the norm is for arcades, but I actually think that may be a little bit on the light side. Still though, if this was just a way to squeeze a few more quarters out of your guests, then I guess the investment was worth it. Heh, <laughs> looks like we got another Takan spelling error. Oh, yeah, this must be one of those gas-fired arcade machines. My bad. The controls seem to be in pretty decent shape. You can see the wear in from people resting their hands while using the joystick, and it seems like the majority of gamers like to use their left hand. The joystick itself isn't too bad, but it does kind of stick a little bit. The buttons seem to work more or less as they should, physically. I gotta say, it's really trippy pressing real arcade buttons in my own home. This is awesome. Okay, so I think I'm going to start with just uh, a nice external clean here, because that'll uh, inspire me to work on the innards a little more. Uh, you know, it's not in terrible shape. Um, I've seen worse. It's got a little bit of mud here probably from flopping around in the back of whatever pickup truck it was <laughs> thrown into on the way here. It's got a bit of mud there. Probably that's just from 
whatever it was transported into the uh, recycling bin. Um, we got this big piece of glass um, that covers up the CRT. I think it's slightly smoked so that you can't see the, the innards of the machine. Um, yeah, I mean, no time like the present. Let's just see what a good wipe will do. And yeah, I'm gonna use a microfiber cloth and uh, blue juice here. It's usually good enough. Thank God for microfiber. pretty good. It's looking much better already. Just... Okay, I gotta find a way to block that movement from happening because that's getting really annoying really fast. So we've actually got a couple ways of adjusting height on this thing. We've got these knobs here. Um, I had speculated that it would let the machine rise up to full height because um, it looks like there's quite a bit of uh, bar in there, uh, but actually it only goes up a few inches and that, that's just how the cabinet's designed. It's designed to be a, a sit-down arcade type deal. Uh, and then on the bottom we've got some feet which basically screw out and that's just kind of for leveling purposes and I, I think the reason it's shaking so much is they're not level. So I'm going to try raising it a bit to see if I can tricky. Okay, so I'll just prop this side up a bit. I'll use this hard drive. It's 120 gig. Not really useful. Oops. There we go. And I'll try to... Early 80s wood grain is definitely coming off. Nice big chunks. I think there's replacements available for that, so I don't, I don't think that's a showstopper. I wish I could just restore what's missing from the top here. I think it just sort of delaminated over time. this to the cash drawer okay I can fix that okay so I found the source of my sound problem it's that when you move it this jostles around this is the access panel for the uh, PCBs um, for now I'm going to solve this by just doing this Try now. There, that kind of quiets it down a little bit. Obviously, I'm going to want to try and figure out how to get that open. I don't have a one of those freezer key things that's big enough to unlock that. I do kind of wonder about the story behind this. Every machine's got a story. The amount of dust this thing has has me thinking it's been sitting since probably at least the Clinton administration. I'm thinking it probably belonged to a restaurant or something, like I said before, and uh, maybe it just got obsoleted and tossed in a storage space somewhere, and then finally someone decided to empty it out. Chuck it out of there. Could have come from one of our local hotels, too, for that matter. We have a couple hotels here that date back to the 50s. 
They may have had something like this in their lobby for years and years and finally decided that we're gonna check it. Just glad I saw it when I did. Yeah, that's cleaning up pretty nice. It's not great, but You can tell it's been used quite a bit by uh, the impressions left by people's fingers as they put the quarters in. I wonder if this mechanism even works. All right, so there we are. Definitely looks better. Doesn't look like it came directly out of a dumpster anymore. Obviously it's got lots of blemishes, but we can live with that until we do something about it. But yeah, it doesn't uh, doesn't look too bad. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if there's a way I can access the back side of the glass and clean that, as well as clean the actual CRT tube, uh, which you saw earlier has tons of dust on it. And then, uh, yeah, we'll take it from there. Okay, so what I'd like to do next is clean the CRT, which you can see earlier is quite dusty. And I also want to get the back side of the glass, and I think... I can do that by removing these screws and sliding the glass panel out. It looks like it's on little wooden runners there, so I think this is intended to be removed and cleaned once in a while. So I'm going to do that and then, uh, yeah, we'll clean her up. It's a very thin piece of glass. Well, actually, that's not just glass. Well, it's got Lexa in there to smoke it a bit. Okay. Let's see how hard this is to remove. There we go. Let's see what you can see. Do not want to break the glass. That would not be good. These kind of clips you can never figure out how to get them off there we go perfect so that's loose so now this smoked lexan should come off a little bit easier see if i can loosen that cord a bit just barely gets enough clearance Okay, so that's what's making it all dark. So we need to really clean that. So with the smoked plexiglass thing removed, we can now see the actual CRT. Alright, spray down. That's coming clean right away. Okay, so that's a lot better. It's much better than it was. Now, can I get the glass out is the question. Real careful, because if I break this, then we've... Tilt it. Oops. Oh, I don't want to break that. Really don't want to break that.
don't want to drop it either. So with the smoked plexiglass thing removed, we can now see the actual CRT. Which we want to get to to clean as well. Definitely some burn in, but if you look closely, you can see the scramble intro screens there. I'm not going to remove the PCBs completely until I get a key to open the other side. For now, I just want to scrub off the heavy dust coating so it doesn't overheat. You know, it's always amazing what a little Windex and elbow grease can do. I mean, this thing looked like complete garbage before, but uh, now it's actually looking like just a really well-worn arcade machine. So yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, I mean, obviously it needs tons of work still. We're gonna need to do something about the faux wood on the cabinet, and we're gonna need to repaint all the metal, but, and we haven't even got into the interior yet, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not embarrassed to say that I saved this thing now, so that's good. Let's uh, move on to the part we're all excited about, which is uh, actually turning it on and seeing what it does. Or more likely, doesn't do. Okay, here's where things get interesting. See, it's one thing to clean someone else's garbage, it's another thing to plug it into your wall socket. After thinking about it and looking things over, I've decided to test this beast in two phases. The first test will be to plug it in and just test the monitor by itself. The second test will test the power supply for the PCBs with the PCBs disconnected, just to make sure all the correct voltages are coming up before hooking it up and potentially frying it. The final phase will be to connect the boards and see what happens. Quite honestly, I have pretty low expectations here. People don't chuck good working arcade machines in a dumpster, usually. Now, I was going to wire up a new power cord, but in the end I decided to just connect a new plug to what was left of the original. I don't really care if that means I just have a really short cord, we're just testing things here for now. A new cord might be on the menu as the restoration gets deeper. I did do a good visual inspection for anything that looked obviously bad or dangerous. The capacitors on the monitor board in particular are a likely trouble spot, but looking closely at the board, I didn't see much wrong actually. It doesn't seem to be anything obviously leaking and the board doesn't seem to be cracked. It's mostly just really dirty. The only thing on the board that had some visible issues was this inductor coil, which is marked 3PO. But after talking with some people in the know, they said it wasn't likely to, you know, explode or anything. With the machine plugged into an extension cord, which is in turn plugged into a switchable power bar, I'm ready to apply power and see what happens. And yes, you're darn right I've got a fire extinguisher handy. Mostly to confuse all the spiders that are likely to come running out. Okay, here we go. Nada. Okay, so that could mean the monitor is dead. Or maybe it just doesn't do anything in the absence of a signal. It's hard to see, but I don't really see the CRT neck lighting up. That may well be why this thing ended up in the trash. Well, let's check our voltages in the PSU here and we'll see if things look safe enough to fire up the actual arcade PCBs. Looking at the sticker on the power supply, it looks like we should expect plus 5, plus 12, and minus 5 volts DC as the outputs for the PCBs. Okay, so we'll fire it up here with our multimeter connected. Plus 5 volts are looking good. Let's check one more time here. Good. Next up, 12 volts. Also looking good. Okay, minus 5 volts next. Yep, that's looking good too. So yeah, I think this power supply is actually in pretty good condition. I mean, yeah, I could hook up my scope and really check these out, but in my experience, 90% of the time, if you've got the right voltages, you're good for some short, basic testing. So let's hook the boards back up and cross fingers. All right, the PCBs are connected. Let's hit the power switch and see if we get any signs of life. Hmm, nothing so far. Oh wait, there's some color splotches right in the middle of the screen. Okay, we've got a few more down the middle. Yeah, we should be seeing more than, oh wait. I see a C and part of an R down there. I think that's for the credits. Yes, these boards are somewhat alive actually and so is a CRT. Wow, look at that. That's actually part of the game shown in the intro screen. Okay, so the PCBs are working and the CRT isn't completely dead. 
But uh, yeah, I, I think this means the CRT tube itself is okay, but there's definitely some issues on the monitor PCB. I think they call this horizontal or vertical collapse. It often comes down to bad capacitors or sometimes cold solder joints. Just for kicks, let's try throwing a quarter in and see if we get any action. Hmm, nothing discernible. And nah, it's not responding at all. Yeah, it's ejecting my coins, so maybe the coin mechanism isn't working or is disabled somehow. I'll try one more time. Yeah, nothing. Yeah, not responding at all and the coin is ejected again. Well, I guess my money's no good here. Not like I could play the game like this anyway, but yeah, it, at least it looks like the game itself is functional. That's awesome. That's one less thing I have to try and fix. But that leaves the CRT, which admittedly I'm a bit of a coward with when it comes to repairing. I've actually gotten zapped a couple times, and while I didn't get tossed across the room or, you know, die, it was unpleasant enough to make me rethink messing around with these. It's hard when you don't have much experience and you have to rely on proving the absence of something you cannot see, namely a charge, that makes it so tricky for a beginner. Like I said, it's probably some new caps and maybe reflowing some solder and we'd be good to go, but still, that anode cap? Yikes. Yeah, that thing scares me. In the past, I've usually sent my CRT projects out to one of the last remaining places in my area that actually repairs them. But this cabinet is way too big and heavy to tote around, and anyway, I don't think they're training any new CRT techs anymore. So at some point I either have to accept CRT death as inevitable, or I have to start fixing them. So maybe in my next video we'll finally tackle the thing I'm most afraid of in this hobby. Getting electrocuted. We'll see if I'm brave enough. If I can get that done, fixing up the cabinet should be a snap by comparison. Hopefully I'll get over that fear, and we'll get a part 2 to this video done soon. Anyway, that's about all for this video. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you soon.